Welcome to another episode of On the Record. Uh, today we have one of the slickest Telecaster players here in Nashville, someone I'm extremely excited to get to sit down and talk to because he uh, does a lot more than play Telecasters. Um, Mr. Kenny Vaughn, thank you so much for sitting down and talking to me today. Thanks uh, for having me. It's yeah, a pleasure to be here. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So I usually start these interviews um, by talking about what a normal day in uh, what a normal work day for you looks like. Um, oh, there is no such yeah. thing. You know? <laughs> I um, expected that. Yeah. Um, well, there, there was a time when I was uh, working, doing a lot of sessions here okay. in Nashville, and I it, it it was like it was pretty every day. You know, pretty much every day you would go sure. to, go to a session at ten a.m. Get there and you know try to be ready to do it and. Sometimes there were sessions at two yeah. in a different place and mm -hmm. six in another place. And it was pretty right. hectic. I had to have a cartage service. I had several over the oh, years. Wow. And, okay. uh, you know, I had to take a lot of guitars and kind of be ready for whatever they threw at you, you mm -hmm. know. And, you know, you never really know yeah. until yeah. you get there. And people will tell you, you know, over the phone what they think they want. And you get there and you, <laughs> if you just brought what they told you you did the wrong thing because sure, sure. often what they say on the phone and what ends up having are two entirely different things sure so you know you have to kind of choose wisely when you're yeah. deciding what to take you know and these days i you know for the last 20 years i've been on the road with marty stewart mm -hmm. and uh you know i still do a lot of sessions yeah. you know for someone that travels a lot but sure. it's not like it used to be really you know it's not i don't do any of the um music row stuff anymore you know, sure sure i haven't even heard i quit listening to country music in like 1990. <laughs> okay you know good for you yeah you know i mean yeah. that whatever happened around that time was just uh it kind of it was over for me you know okay uh, I, I enjoyed when i got here in 87 it was uh during what they called the great credibility scare Mm -hmm. And that was Steve Earle had hits in the top ten. Mm -hmm. uh, Lyle Lovett mm -hmm. was having hits in the top ten. Roseanne Cash was having hits in the top ten. Dwight yeah. Yoakam. Yeah. And these are people that, you know, were had their own style of country music, but it was uh, lyrically uh, honest stuff. And sure. it was, you know, wasn't such a um, uh, formula. Right. You know, well, they each had their own formula, I'm sure, sure but it sure. Well, didn't pertain to Music Row and all that stuff. And, right. And somehow they were having hits. Yeah. You know, it was like, wow, this is cool. You know, all <laughs> these great people. And then after a few years, that just like tanked. And, yeah. And country music went the other way and became Walmart, um, <laughs> you know, commodity, you know. And, sure. And sure. It never recovered. You know, that was the end of it. Sure. So, you know. As a listener, I was no longer interested after 1990. Yeah, there was nothing there for me. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. I've always been attracted to, uh, um, you know, certain songwriters and the way they produce records. Uh, you know, people say, "Oh, you you really like the way Merle Haggard's guitar player played the Telecaster." And I was like, "I would have liked the way he played any guitar." <laughs> it, it was, but it really, uh, it was more about well, and it turned out there was five different guys playing that Telecaster. You know, yeah, yeah. There was, you know, James Burton first yeah. and foremost, and Roy Nichols and Phil Baugh, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a couple others that were in on that stuff too. Mm -hmm. um, that actually played years later i found out wait that's not roy nichols on that <laughs> cut wait that's not james burton on that cut there's all these different guys that were playing those sessions yeah reggie young played yeah. or later on uh, mm -hmm. but um it was more about the sound of those records and the way merle haggard sang and the way he yeah. wrote and the way they treated it is also, it's almost more like folk music than it was country music you know sure um, and, it, and in the 1960s, it had this beautiful, you know, the way they made records was really cool. And it yeah. just had a certain sound that really attracted right. me to it. And it, sure. I didn't think of it as being country music. <laughs> I just liked it. You know? right. And the same goes for Buck Owens and the Buckaroos. And yeah. like 64, 65, um, I, the guy that lived across the street from me, his father had those records. And I was just knocked out by him. 
And again, I had no idea that Buck Owens was a country artist. Sure. Really, I didn't think of it that way. You know? Yeah, yeah. And you know, Tiger by the Tail, and where I grew up in Denver, was on the same station that played James Brown and the Beatles and the Supremes. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah. Whoever. It was all and, just you music. Know, so you yeah. you go from Papa's Got a Brand New Bag and to uh, Together Again. You know. <laughs> Yeah. And that's just the way it was in those days. So people didn't, people weren't as uh, narrow in their listening scope back in those days as they seem to be now. Sure. I, maybe they're not. No, no. I, no it I, just appears to be that, yeah. that way. But they were, there were weren't all those divisions yet. Sure. Well, one of the reasons that I ask about a normal day mm -hmm. uh, is, I think that it's informative to learn about whether you have like a practice schedule, you know, or a practice routine on your instrument. No, I don't. Um, a normal okay. day for me is waking up and thinking about w how much I'd like to be working on something on the guitar and how and trying to figure out how I'm going to do that that day. Okay. You know, I have children and sure. wife and <laughs> um, Life. responsibilities, yeah. Yeah. And work that I have to do, things, you know, and you just have to make time to do it. and. I love to play, sit around and play, you know. Sure. Um, yeah. And that's uh, that's still my favorite thing to do. Sure. You know? On yeah. the road, I, if it's a day off, I always bring a guitar to the hotel room and sure. And, and use that time to. Yeah. That's like, I've got no <laughs> responsibilities today. I can sit on the bed and watch TV and play my guitar play my all guitar. day long. Right. You know? And well, so, so yeah. that's 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 a, you know one thing I always look forward to. Sure. Well, let's dive into that a little bit. Sure. Because I think that actually segues pretty well into one of the topics that I wanted to hit, which is, um, so you've been, like you said, uh, on the road with uh, Marty Stewart. 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. And I'm sure that touring over that period of time has changed in terms of, of uh, what it looks like. Um, just yeah, not, not so much for us. It's okay. pretty much like it always was, really. Okay. Can you describe not... uh, a little bit about that? Well, um, you know, uh, Marty Stewart runs a really tight organization. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a very uh, good with people, and he knows how to select people to do, uh, to be in his crew and his driver and all that. He, he's very good about getting good people to do that and keeping okay. them you yeah. know, around. So yeah. he has a good crew, good driver, nice bus. Everything's clean, no loud music, no TV. <laughs> It's like really nice place. Yeah. We go on the road to get rest. I always say, you know, <laughs> oh, how do you guys do it out here on the road? I was like, this is nothing compared to being in town. This is great. <laughs> you know, I could sleep till 11 every day or wow. noon or yeah. whatever yeah. and get up. And there's a guy there that says, uh, Kenny, your, your shower is so good here today. And, uh, you know, lunch is at 1 and, and uh, dinner is at 6 and sound checks at 4.30. And, you know, I don't have to do anything. Wow. You know. Wow, that's I just show up and yeah, you know, all I have to do is whatever he tells me to, you know, road that's, manager. It's yeah. pretty easy. So it's it's really a nice situation to be in. Wow. He tr he tends to avoid airports airports okay. as much as possible, okay. which is good because the one thing that that is what, something that changed, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, flying used to be a whole lot more convenient than it is now. And now it's a okay. real pain in the ass to get a hillbilly band through an airport. <laughs> you know, I mean, sure. it's just, oh, you know, with our guitars and our gear and, yeah. and, you know, costumes and all that stuff. It's like, whoa, this is a headache. <laughs> it never goes, you know, it's always, you always have to get there really early and plan on being there for a long time, you know, sure. in the yeah. airport. Uh, when you said the bus, everybody travels on the same bus? Yeah, that's four okay. band members and four crew people and then two drivers. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Ten people, including the two drivers. Sure. You know, that's, that's easy. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, so would you say that your time is, is uh, I guess, non-COVID times? Your time is split on the road and in town. What, what would that percentage makeup be? Well, when uh, in eight, 2018 and 19, we were averaging right around 140 dates a year. Wow. So okay. you put some, you know, days on either side of some of those shows, you know, it's going to be like 100 and at least 160, 170 days that you're gone. Wow. You know, with, you know, some sometimes you're on the West Coast, that adds mm -hmm. extra time. To, sure. You know. But uh, and there's always, you know, occasional day off on the road. So, yeah, you know. 
Mm-hmm. I, I've never really done the exact math on how many days I was actually gone, but it was somewhere around there. You know? Okay. And when you're here in town, I know you mentioned that you still get hired for sessions. Yeah, I do. But um, I think that one of the, or let me just pose the question to mm-hmm. you. Um, when people talk about you yeah. as a guitar player, um, a lot of the things you hear people say is, you know, he's the real deal. He's, you know, the guitar player's guitar player. He's genuine. He's, you know, uh, very traditional. But I don't necessarily think that that's how you view yourself. Um, well, I can be that when sure. I need to be. You sure. Know? I mean, I, I try to, when somebody hires me, I try to give them what they really need for their project. You sure. Know? If, you know, and there's been a few times when I was unqualified to play certain things. You know? <laughs> uh, but, uh, you but know, when I backed out, you know, said, hey, you know, you might want to call somebody that can do this better than I can. But, you know, <laughs> for the most part, it's you just try to figure sure. out where they're really coming from, and what they really want. Oftentimes mm-hmm. people have trouble verbalizing that. Yes. You know, they you know, I don't know how many times I get a call. Hey, Kenny, uh, we're going to do a real traditional country telly thing on this, you know, and I walk out of there and I was thinking there was no traditional country <laughs> telly on that recording, you know, there was right. zero, you know, so, you know, they say a lot of times people don't really know what they're, how to verbalize something correctly, right. you know, right. to really give you an idea of what you really actually need to be doing. So, sure. you no, know, I, you have to be an interpreter, definitely. you know, you yeah. have to. Sometimes you have to ask a lot of questions and, right, um, you know, ask for examples and all that kind of stuff. Sure. And you know, oftentimes I won't even ever open the telly case. Yeah, you know, it yeah. never even comes out of the case. Sure, because it's not applicable as much as some other guitar would be. Right. Well, I guess where I was going with that question is with your own musical projects, you play more than just country, right? I would say so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a lot, yeah. 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 Um, can you tell us about some of the stuff that you're doing other than the Marty Stewart uh, gigs? Well, yeah, I've got a, um, a little blues, uh, little low-watt sort of wheezy little um, trad- sort of like old-school blues band that I played every Monday night at this mm-hmm. gig uh, with uh, Jeffrey Clemens, who's a a singer and a drummer. He plays for the for G Love. Mm-hmm. This has been his gig for twenty seven years, twenty eight oh, wow. years. Okay, uh, he's been playing that gig, mm-hmm. traveling all over the world playing G Love. They just played Red Rocks the other night. Oh, cool! And um, uh, actually, they played there twice in the last month. Um, and and uh, it's kind of a. We just did it for fun because mm-hmm. we like those old tunes. There's like a lot of 50s stuff. Sure. We don't play any of that sports bar, bowling right. shirt blues kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, none of that sort of, you know, l- l- loud stuff. Right. We're much more really quiet and pretty, um, you know, yeah, old school. And but, but we just do it for fun. Sure. But that turned into a really good thing for me because I had played blues a lot in the late 60s into the 70s you know where I was making money doing it mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and and I enjoyed it and it was nice to get back to that music that I really always kind of liked a lot yeah like playing you know Johnny Guitar Watson tunes and, very cool yeah and um, um, stuff like that you know uh, lazy Lester tunes mm-hmm. um, uh, Snooks Eaglin mm-hmm. from New Orleans. We play a lot of that kind of stuff. And, Very cool. And a lot, of, so a lot of the Fats Domino stuff that you've never heard. Sure. Um, lots of that kind of stuff. So it was really fun for me to yeah. get into that. Very cool. Yeah, and we're still up and running. We, it's called the Imperial Blues Hour. And then mm-hmm. um, uh, Dave Rowe and I have, the, have a band that we've had for years called the Slow Beats. Mm-hmm. It's a trio, and it's more of a rock and roll kind of thing yeah uh, we write all these songs and he's mostly the ma- basic singer the lead singer and uh it's we played last night at d's in madison and mm-hmm. uh that's a fun gig to play with people would say a lot of people would, might call it prog rock or something like that but we <laughs> cover a lot of different stuff some funky stuff and um 
uh, songs with unusual changes that we write. And, yeah. you know, I get to do a couple of instrumentals that are that I've written that are a little bit more forward thinking than what you might um, hear me do normally. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You've actually um, you did a performance here mm -hmm. once, right? Yeah, that yeah. was that band. Yeah, yeah. we're actually um, we're actually sitting in Richard Smith's recording studio, um, and uh, the live stream that we're talking about is um, TuneStream, and there will be a link below. And uh, yeah, so one of the other things that I kind of wanted to to talk about with you in this interview was, um, you know, when I'm when I'm prepping to do an interview. I try to do as much research as possible and talk to people, um, you know, who have played with you or who know who know you. And one of the things that kept on coming up when I was doing my research, and I didn't actually know this about you, was um, your you and a handful of other people are credited for kind of breathing life back into the club scene on Broadway. Well, and yeah, I just happened to be. It's a total accident that okay. I ended up there. Uh, uh, I was. I had um, come to like a sort of a plateau in my guitar playing, and I was searching for a teacher here. Okay. And I, you know, I've been playing a lot of road gigs and studio sessions and everything, and mm -hmm. I was kind of like, uh, uh, I just felt like I need somebody to help me, you know, break into some new things, you know. And sure. And I saw this ad for a guy that had just graduated from Berkeley. And I thought maybe I should try that. <laughs> you know, a guy that's j fresh out of college sure. with a, you know, young guy with a whole head full of the latest stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went over to this guy's house and, you know, took a couple of lessons from him. And and he was uh, roommates with this guy. And he said, man, I'm playing with this guy every weekend. His name's Greg Gehring. He's really good. And I was like, yeah. And he told me what kind of music they were playing. I said, wow, that sounds cool. Mm -hmm. They were doing music from the honky-tonk era, which is post World War II till about 1955 was what they were kind of doing. Oh, cool. And, um, and I was like, yeah, I like Conky Tonk music. You know, I was <laughs> always, I remember when I was uh, probably about 12, when I got my first guitar, uh, I had a little neighborhood band and our other guitar player's mom turned us on to Hank Williams. Mm -hmm. And everybody, every, no one liked it but me. Okay. Every, all my friends, you know, <laughs> that I was playing with, they were like, that's, sure. that's, that's, that's just awful, you know. <laughs> I was like, that's killer, man. Who is this guy, you know. I'd heard of Hank Williams, you know, sure, and I've heard, sure. I'd heard your cheating heart maybe a little, <laughs> maybe. But I yeah. didn't really, she had, you know, like long playing compilation records and stuff. Yeah, you know, they yeah. didn't have, Hank Williams never, never made LPs, you know. Right. He was dead before that even happened, before right. you could even that get LPs. But yeah. By the by, the time I was twelve, it was like the middle sixties. I think she had some, you know, compilation thing of some. So I, I you know, maybe I heard twelve songs, you know, okay. mm -hmm. and I was knocked out. I was like, wow, that's really great. Why does that s music sound so good, you know? And of course, the musicians were incredible, you know. And you know, Sammy Pruitt was yeah. a jazz guitar player, mm -hmm. playing hillbilly music, you yeah. know, on an arch top. Yeah, you know, big arch top jazz guitar, and right. Zeke Clements, uh, mm -hmm. the other guitar player, same thing, jazz sure. guitar player playing hillbilly music. And yeah. I was like, man, I love the way those guys play the guitar <laughs> on those songs, you know. And uh, you know, Jerry Rivers on the fiddle, and Don Helms on the steel, and Jerry Bird was the other, the earlier steel player. I was like, you know, wow, this just knocked me out. You know, I was like, this sounds great. You know, I didn't even know that it wasn't a pedal steel. I, you know. I didn't know it was a straight steel with no pedals, you know, it was mm -hmm. just like, yeah. cause I didn't have any reference for it. Sure. But, but anyway, um, so I was into that era of music. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a, uh, in the eighties in Denver, they started showing those Ganaway films that were made in the fifties um, on the PBS network. And so I got to see little Jimmy Dickens, you know, yeah. in 19, 54, wow. yeah. 55, doing yeah. his thing. Carl Smith. Mm -hmm. um, uh, who else was on that show? All of Ray Price. Back uh, yeah. when he, before he went, right before he changed uh, his vocal style, yeah. and dropped it down a minor third to a deeper yeah. voice, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, all, you know, it was that era. And it was fascinating because they were playing live. 
you know, in the okay. on the sound stage, and you were like, "Wow, <laughs> all these people playing that music," and you're watching them actually play it. It was just like, it was so captivating to me. You know, it's like, sure. man, this is great to be able to watch these people play and sing. You know, it's sure. knocked out. Yeah, and so, um, you know, I was always interested in that kind of music. So anyway, Greg was <laughs> supposedly singing this kind of music and mm -hmm. uh so i went down there to uh see him and uh, a friend of mine a steel player named bucky baxter they were on break and this is in the back room at tootsie's before it had a roof on it and I, mm -hmm. so i came walking down the alley and there's all these kids in there because it would it was outside and you had to go inside to get okay a beer mm -hmm. You could bring it out, but you couldn't. You had to yeah. go inside to purchase it, and they wouldn't sure. let anybody inside that was underage. Yeah. And um, so, you know, there's all these punk rock kids, and there's this, you know, there's a, a band with an upright bass, arch top rhythm guitar. The lead singer is play, l playing a, a, a Martin guitar into mm -hmm. a microphone. Sure. Yeah. No, no pickup on the arch top guitar. Just you okay. know, a yeah. microphone only, and and then an upright steel player. Oh, okay. no, no, no pedals. Yeah. playing yeah. through an amp. That was the only amp up there. Wow. And I was like, and then they went up. And anyway, my friend Bucky Baxter introduced me to Greg, who I just met, but I don't think he remembered me. <laughs> and um, and he said, "Man, you got to get this guy up to play with you, Greg." And he goes, "All right, yeah, okay, nice to meet you." Whatever, whatever, you know. And so he goes up and he starts singing. I'm like, and then he goes up to play a solo and he's playing this Martin guitar mm -hmm. into the vocal mic and he absolutely destroys that thing, just <laughs> playing like a demon. I'm like, holy shit, this guy's amazing, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, wow. And then a couple of songs in, oh, we're going to get a friend of ours, Kenny Vaughn, up here to play some guitar. You know, I'm like, and there was an electric <laughs> guitar there. Some yeah. guy was sitting in with him. And so I, picked up his electric guitar and it was a hollow body i can't remember what it was but it was a hollow body guitar and it had a little amp mm -hmm. and so we you know greg just launches into another song and sure and and so we we play a couple of songs and i play this one solo and then somebody else takes a solo and he he's in the middle of the song he, re, he leans over to me what are you doing tomorrow night <laughs> <laughs> i said um I don't know nothing. He said, "Be here at nine. and uh, <laughs> so that was how I got the gig, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, okay. So I started playing with him, and this was 1994, mm -hmm. and I played with him. For, we played for that rest of that summer into the fall, and uh, then we moved in inside into the back room in the winter time for a little while, and then the next summer we did it again and started in the late spring and played all summer long into okay. the early fall at, there at the, in the back room at Tootsie's. And so um, th that's also where I went, where I met Lucinda Williams, because she was enamored with Greg. She sure. would come to every show and sit there and watch him. And then Greg would take a break and give Lucinda his acoustic guitar, and she'd go up and sing a couple of her songs wow. uh, while we were taking a break yeah. by herself, you know. Yeah. And um, I'd heard her records that she made with Gurf Morlix and uh, my friend Ray Kennedy uh, was, I knew that she was in the studio at that time producing a record with Ray Kennedy and Steve Earle producing mm -hmm. because I'd been talking to Ray and I knew that that was going on. So, you know, we became friends and at that particular gig, there was always a party after the show. Okay. Because it was only Fridays and Saturday nights. So we would mm -hmm. go over to this guy's house lived over by Centennial Park that had a studio there. And um, we would go there and party till, you know, four in the morning or whatever. <laughs> and Lou, Lou was there a lot. And so mm -hmm. I got to, you know, became friends with her. Yeah. And um, uh, that's how I got the Lucinda gig. Uh, wow. Which came along maybe a year or so later, around 70, 97 is when I started playing with her. 97, 98, 99 is when I toured with her. Sure. We toured yeah. Yeah. nonstop. I mean. Right. Frank Kalari was her manager, and he had this whole plan. He says, I'm going to take this person and develop her following, and mm -hmm. we're going to, you know, and he did everything exactly like um, he said he would. We started out in a van with three people, just a guitar, bass, and her, and then we started adding people, and then we 
finally got around to, to a bus. We were playing clubs first, then we came back through the cities and played bigger places. And then wow. uh, yeah. we ended up in the last year, uh, do, we did uh, 35 shows opening for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. So, you know, we yeah. went from <laughs> small from to, 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 to yeah. bigger, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that guy was a great manager, and uh, he really did good. And, and the record that she put out was called Carl Wills on it gravel road mm -hmm. anyway, yeah that, that's how Great i got album. into that gig was through yeah. greg but anyway back to greg um so you know he's playing you know honky-tonk music and really wild just great fantastic you know no drums mm -hmm. i'm playing mm -hmm. a little gibson arch top yeah with yeah. a little tiny fender amp you know and <laughs> mo you know it's because it's yeah. acoustic and yeah. electric instruments me and the steel and then everything yeah. else was acoustic and on microphones no plug-in acoustics no pickups on Mm -hmm. anything you know yeah and um uh that was really great for me because he was not playing by any rules because he'd come you know he'd been playing with jimmy martin and the sunny mountain boys he was playing fiddle for jimmy okay and um which i was fairly in awe of the fact that he was <laughs> a sunny mountain boy i was like yeah. you played with jimmy martin oh. <laughs> you know so he he, he had really some hellacious bluegrass chops on the guitar too. He was you have to. He was to, a shredder. Yeah. And um, he he played almost every instrument. He can play piano and he can play everything. But uh, you know, I learned a lot just working with him, and it was a really fun little gig, man. I just played with him two nights ago. Very cool. At the yeah Jolton Hardware. <laughs> I don't know if you've been out there. It's pretty uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty um, groovy. Yeah. I'd never been there before. I was like, wow, this is fun. And leave it to Greg to turn up a cool gig like that. But <laughs> anyway, so we well, would get some nights when we got done, we, uh, we would walk over to Robert's. So uh, we would uh, play our show at the Tootsie's. And normally we were done by midnight or a little after. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we would go next door to Robert's and, because there was a band called BR549 playing there. And at that time, Robert's was really a decrepit place. I mean, it was wow. it was this little portable bar on wheels, okay. and that's all they had, and a tub okay. of bush light, and a, like maybe four bottles of alcohol back there. Wow. And in, on a, in a rolling <laughs> bar, you know, yeah, and yeah. Miss Maddie was the bartender, and she had been... Um, a bar bartending on Lower Broadway since the 60s. Oh, wow. And um, l early 60s, maybe late 50s, perhaps. Oh, wow. But she knew all the old She'd operating stars all, and yeah. everything, and she was friends with all those people, and she was kind of an icon down there. But, you know, I mean, at the time, Lower Broadway was still Skid Row. Next yeah. door to Roberts, where, where the Jack's Barbecue is now, was a a porn shop, and it was like a porn shop from a Wes Craven movie. It was like... <laughs> You know, I remember my wife and I went in there once. We were just like, we just got to go and look at this place. And it was just like, it was a, a porn shop from a horror movie. You know, <laughs> it was like these, these awful old winos and they were lurking around, you know, and the place <laughs> smelled like death. You know, it was like, oh, wow. my God. Wow. It was just like nothing sexy about this. You know, we were just like, wow. <laughs> You know, the other side of life, you know, and, right, and right. There, all, there was all these skid row bars and, you know, the police would not even go down there. You know, there's nothing down there. You could wow. park, you pull up in front of Tootsie's any day of the week, night or day yeah. and park your car. And I mean, so there was never a today. problem getting a yeah. place to park. It, it, you know, <laughs> that was it, you know. Yeah. And um, BR549 had just started playing. And, and at the time it was Gary Bennett and Chuck Mead singing and playing and they had uh, Mr. Bones playing electric bass and Shaw Wilson the drummer was playing drums and okay. Bugs was playing uh, his tenor saxophone okay <laughs> <laughs> and they made the almost amusing squawking you know <laughs> wheezing sort of calamity you know that you know the the only probably the only really professional musician in that out outfit was uh, Mr. Bones the bass player <laughs> and he was kind of funky he was really good yeah and he kind of held it all together and and chuck was you know a good guitar player and a good front man and and they sang well you know and, but it was pretty uh different you know and i really liked it it was like man this is great it's like punk rock country 
And they were okay. also playing the honky tonk era stuff. Sure. So it was like, wow, these guys are like minded retro weirdos like me. <laughs> and, um, you know, I really liked them. And they held on to that gig and took that bar from Skid Row to making a lot of money. You yeah. know, that when I, when, I, when I started going there, you know, we, we'd be like, be Saturday night at, you know, 12 30 at night, and the place was empty except for whatever people we brought in with us you know mm -hmm. and maybe a few bums you know <laughs> and miss maddie and you know it was like wow what a weird place boots on the wall and, yeah yeah you know it was really dirty and dusty in there it's it hard, before yeah. before jesse lee jones the current owner bought it yeah. you know he, but robert moore was Great. still running it and um he was an oddball it's just hard Great to guy, imagine, I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah now. it was. Yeah. Well, you know, there wasn't anything down there. Pe no, normal yeah. people wouldn't go down there ever. Wow. There was no way. You yeah. Know? I mean, you know, it was there was no reason to go downtown back in those days. There was a uh, over on Second Avenue. There was a um, a club that had um, techno music. It was called the Underground. Okay. And so, I remember going in there quite a bit before I played on Lower Broadway. But that was Second Avenue. It was a little bit nicer over bit, there and yeah. the underground was kind of a cool place okay you know lots of kids um they'd stay open to like four in the morning and lots of kids mm -hmm. uh, doing ecstasy and at that time <laughs> do you know those late yeah. night techno yeah. people right right you know it's most college kids you know and stuff yeah. and back when nashville was you know vanderbilt was more like a college than it is now oh yeah it was had more college kids than yeah what, than what you see now sure sure you know i don't know what it's not like a normal college, you know. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. So, so um, that was how that whole thing started, and then yeah, I didn't really play down there too much after that. After Greg's two years there, um, until right around the end of the '90s, when I quit playing on the road for about two years there, I um was doing sessions all the time and I started subbing for Johnny Highland um, occasionally on Don Kelly's gig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was really hard because yeah. you know, it was all these really fast guitar solos yeah. in songs that w was kind of weird because he'd be he you know, I remember the first time I played Mama Tried with him by <laughs> Merle Haggard, which is mm -hmm. a you know, a sad tale about this guy's going to be in prison for the rest of his life and you know mama tried but she failed you know and it's like a yeah, sad yeah. terrible song yeah and these guys are playing it like it's a party song and there's like <laughs> 10 <laughs> solos in a row yeah 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 mama tried oh yeah, yeah i'm in 21 in prison and i'm like oh, this is kind of strange but you know yeah it was really going over well with the crowd and they made a lot of money and oh yeah and i was glad to do it because it was really a challenge for me to play that many notes for yeah. that many hours, you know. And I'd not play the same th thing over and over again. Well, yeah. yeah, I tried not to, but, you know, golly, it's <laughs> like, geez, so many guitar solos. Yeah. And it was, you know, great practice. That's the nature of the Don Kelly band. Yeah, yeah I used to see Don when he was over on uh, Murfreesboro Road, and um, mm -hmm. uh, Brent Mason was playing guitar for him. Yeah. Yeah, and that was really something. Yeah, both and, Brent and Johnny have been on the show. And then yeah. uh, when they had, um, when Brent left, uh, he, he went through so, several people, but then he got Red Volkart, which was Red's been on the show amazing. too. Yeah, I mean that was yeah. that was just the best thing ever. Was when he had that gig. Oh yeah, he played so great, amazing. Oh, he still plays great, and he's a great singer yeah. too. He I is. Love his he's a great entertainer. Yeah, definitely. That was really a great era for that band. I I really enjoyed that. Yeah, that was that was fantastic. Somebody put up a a video of them playing with Red and the band uh, not too long ago on Facebook, and I watched it. I was like, man, that's that was great. That I'll was have great to find time. that. Yeah, yeah, I think it was Gail, the bartender, Gail Norman. Oh, okay, she's been one of the bartenders there yeah. for about twenty years. Okay, or more. Yeah. I'll have to try I to think find it that. was her page, Gail Very Norman. Cool. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> talking about your career a little bit and um, sort of how you made a name for yourself and, and started really uh, gaining momentum, for you, was it the storybook 
one day you got a particular gig or a particular job that just, you know, put you on the map or was yeah. it? Okay. Yeah, I, I was really lucky. Um, you know, I was, uh, I, I had, um, you know, I, I started playing garage rock, you know, for mm-hmm. fun, you know, mm-hmm. in my neighborhood band. And that's all I really wanted to do. It's back in uh, Denver. The, yeah, in the 1960s. Yeah. And, um, and then, I, you know, I had a really good guitar teacher that steered me away from purchasing a jazz. A, I wanted a Jaguar, and he said, don't get a Jaguar. He said, you want a Telecaster? I said, no, I want a Jaguar. <laughs> he said, no, you don't. And he pointed to uh, the record cover, Having a Rave Up with the Yardbirds, mm-hmm. and there's a picture of Jeff Beck holding an Esquire there, and he says, you know that, you know, if you want to sound like that guy, you're not going to get it with a Jaguar. You're going to have to have a <laughs> Telecaster. I was like, oh, oh. And I was like, okay. Yeah. And it turns out the, um, it was a cheaper guitar, so it was like... It worked out. Yeah, I had a paper out and saved some money. And my dad was friends with Johnny Smith. Oh, wow. And before I had a guitar, my dad used to take me down to Shaner's on Saturday nights to watch Johnny Smith play. Yeah. And so Johnny had a... a, a store in the Colorado Springs mm-hmm. about an hour away and so when we finally got some money together and my dad helped me out we went down and bought a brand new 66 Telecaster never okay. been played do you still have it no I, oh. yeah, it got stolen but oh, uh, wow. uh, that was you know it was really great to know Johnny and you know, yeah watch him you know I, I kind of became friends with him a little bit and, oh wow you know my I used to go down there when I was playing professionally and hang out with him in his store sometimes. Um, <laughs> he was great, man. What a guy. And that was the first guy I ever saw play guitar, you know, like up That's, close. So I mean, my dad would take me and sit, sit me like six feet away from Johnny Smith and said, now watch this guy play the guitar. This guy, my friend Johnny can really play the guitar. My friend Johnny. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, that. you know, and I'm watching him play. So, you know. I, you know, I had that in my head before I ever picked up a guitar. Wow. You know, that was what, that was my orientation, you know, in person. I can't think of about a better one. Right, you know, wow. I mean, yeah. and I remember when I was playing professionally in the 70s, people would come up and say, man, you have really good technique. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> I, I didn't know what they were talking about, you know. And then finally, yeah. you know, after thinking about that, I was like, oh, Johnny's it's because I tried to play like he plays, yeah. you know. Yeah. That's what I, that's how I thought you played, you know. Sure. And, you well, know. there's a, there's Bill Frizzell in there somewhere, yeah. too, right? Yeah, um, I walked into my um, local music store. It was Melody Music on Acoma Street in Inglewood. Mm-hmm. I was, I, I always was in that place. It, that was the Gibson dealership, and they had all the latest Gibson guitars. So I would go in there all the time and buy strings and, you know. Sure. Yeah, I was yeah. down there bothering. Yeah, the, local the guitar owner. store. Yeah, and it changed hands and uh, a, a nicer guy bought it <laughs> than, the, than the couple that had it before. Yeah. And um, uh, he was really kind of an up, he was a jazz guitar player. And he was a nice guy and he was very friendly and uh, helpful. And I went walked in there one day to get some strings and there was this guy over in the corner playing guitar. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of a hippie. Yeah, you know, just sort of bent over guitar and he was playing this beautiful <laughs> stuff, and I was like, "Gordon, who is that guy, man?" He said, "Oh, that's my new guitar teacher, Bill Frizzell." I was like, "I want to take lessons from that guy." And I didn't even wow. meet him that day. I, he wow. just signed me up to play, take yeah. lessons, you know. Yeah. So I go in there and I start taking lessons from Bill. You know, I was pretty well on my way. To, I could play, but sure. you know, he was the first guy that really broke open my knowledge of the fretboard. Mm-hmm. and how to apply uh, music theory to changes, you know. Wow. And that's kind of what he worked on with me, you know. Not so much about how to play, yeah. but how to think, wow. you know. And so that was really, really helpful. And then one he, one day, Bill hasn't changed, by the way, since that day. <laughs> He's still exactly the same. And I, I remember about three months in, I went in one day, and I said, hey, man. And he says, hey, uh, this is gonna be our last lesson, man. Uh, I said, whoa, well, what's going on? He said, I gotta get out of here, man. I, I, this place is gonna kill me. I gotta go to New York and do something, you know? Wow. And I said, what are you gonna do? He said, I don't know. He said, I don't wanna be a regular jazz guitar player. I don't wanna get playing a restaurant, going to play in the standards, <laughs> you know? 
And I was like, yeah, I can see that. That would be a drag. And um, so, you, you know, the rest is history. We went yeah. to New York. Well, and, but we're still friends. And we're oh, still, wow. Yeah. Still in touch. So he's, uh, he's someone who I hope to be able to meet one day. Oh, he's a lovely yeah. fellow. Yeah. Hasn't changed that much since the day <laughs> I met him. But wow. I really learned a lot. And I it mostly probably when I think about things musically, I still go back to what I learned from him, you know, wow. about just how to, you know, look at the fretboard mm -hmm. and your choices yeah. and what the important notes are and, you know, how to get rid of unnecessary notes, yeah. you know, yeah. and how to get the good ones, you know, emphasize the interesting ones and just leave the other ones out. Yeah, and, for sure. And I, that was really a good lesson for me, the way he taught me all that stuff. And, uh, you know, it was very, I was so lucky yeah. to have that. You know, first Johnny Smith, then Bill Frizzell. Talk about wow. two. Yeah, I mean, you know, I can't think of, that's I, like. You know, <laughs> I stumbled into both those people, basically. You know, yeah. I didn't seek them out. You know, they wow. were just there in front of me, you know. And right. I was like, wow, this is great, you know. And. Um, kind of right place, right time yeah. sort of thing. Wow. But, you know, I was, you know, it, when you learn jazz theory in the fretboard, it, it, you can take that into any area of music, really. You know? Sure. It, yeah. it helps you no matter what style of music you're playing, you know. Yeah. And then uh, the whole country thing uh, came about, you know, I was a high school dropout. Um, I was, my parents left home when I was 18 and left me on my own, sort of, to my own devices. So... I, and to me, the idea of getting a job was like, for whatever reason, it was like, might as well just go to prison. You know, I was like, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to get a job. I'm not going to do that. You know, sure. I need, I, I yeah. can't go to work and then be a musician. You know, yeah. I just like, I couldn't, I couldn't never even, that was never even a consideration. I was not going to do it. Okay. And I stumbled into this gig down the street with, this, with these old guys that were really good and they were playing old country music. Okay. And I, I remember going in, I had a fake ID and I would go in there <laughs> and listen to them and I was like, man, these guys are great. And they, one of them found out I was a guitar player and, and the guy um, that was sort of the leader said, hey, you know, we could, you know, can you play this stuff? And I said, well, I can try, you know. Yeah, yeah. I haven't really ever played it, but I understand it, you know. And, he said, well, um, we need somebody Friday night, you know, and I went down there and played. And next thing you know, I was their guitar player. Yeah. And I was playing five nights a week, making pr pretty good money, playing for old people, with old people. <laughs> and I was this young, you know, crazy yeah. punk rock kind of guy. Yeah. And they're old, crazy hillbillies. <laughs> and they liked me, and I liked them, and... That was sort of how I broke into the Denver country music scene, okay. which was pretty big still yeah. at that time. Right. There was a, a street called West 44th Street, and there was a lot of big country bars on that street. There was three, actually. But they were all really good, and they were running the country music seven nights a week. And oh, wow. I ended up working in all those places over the years on and off mm -hmm. and uh, got to know all the personalities and the lead singers that had bands and yeah. just the whole culture, you know. <coughs> I was an alien <laughs> to the culture, and I was basically living a double life uh, in my life in that world, mm -hmm. and then my life in my world where I had my own little rock and roll band. Yeah, yeah. But the cool thing about playing the country gigs was if you went and played one, you, you could go up to the leader and say, Hey, you know, Friday night I got a gig with my band, and he said, Well, I, I said, I can get, you know, Gary to play for me uh, mm -hmm. Friday night. He said, okay, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Send Gary. All right. Just sub. Take yeah. care, son. Mm -hmm. Be careful. <laughs> you know? And so that was great because yeah. I could, you know, I could walk in and out of that, you know, guaranteed income. Yeah. You know, and not have to travel. Wow. You yeah. know, it was, I didn't have to go. My friends were all like, why do you play country music, man? I was like, well. <laughs> why do you play top 40 music dude you know <laughs> i get i i make as much money as you make and i don't have to i walk down the street to play my gig and you have to go to nebraska for a month to play in a holiday inn and wear uniforms and play songs by people you don't even like you know you know and i was like yeah no way i don't want to play journey you know 
I don't want to do that. That sounds as bad as having a job, you know? I was like, forget that, you know? I, I'd much rather be playing, you know, old Ray Price songs and old Merle Haggard songs oh, and yeah. Willie Nelson songs and Waylon Jennings songs than I <laughs> yeah. would be playing, you know, Ted Nugent or, you know, <laughs> whatever you had right. to play in those yeah. days. You know, yeah. it's like, forget that. You know, that sounds yeah. awful. And um, so that was really good for me because I was able to develop my little... I also had a progressive uh, jazz band at that time that played oh, on wow. Sunday nights. Um, but that only lasted a couple of years, and there was no money in that. But we had a great group. I was, <laughs> yeah. it was really a cool little group, and I learned sure. a lot about stuff in that group because I was the only guy that played chords. It was a, the instrumentation was drums, bass, a saxophone, and me. Oh, so I okay. was the guy that had to play the chords, yeah. and yeah. you know when it was my turn to solo. I had to, right? I couldn't just, you know, I still had to make sure that I was playing yeah. the changes, yeah. you know, and outlining the, the right. tonality while I was soloing, yeah. you know. I, I just couldn't just, like, blow a bunch of go stuff, and, you know. Right. And uh, so that was a good thing to do. And But I developed a little a rock and roll band. We started traveling, and that led to me living in Chicago for a while and then later on New York City for a while. Wow. I came back to Denver, went back to playing uh, music for money mm -hmm. in the country bars. Mm -hmm. Had a pretty cool little band, and... Uh, one day in the mid '80s, the phone rang, and uh, it was a friend of mine, and he was calling for me from Nashville. I I didn't know he'd moved to Nashville. He had been living in L.A., mm -hmm. and he'd been playing out there with, uh, but he'd been playing the L.A. country bar scene with you know like Dwight Yoakam and those yeah. kind of people, and uh, James Entfield, and yeah. a lot of those folks were around in those days. And um, he'd moved to Nashville with Vince Gill. Oh. whose wife had a recording contract mm -hmm. with her sister. Mm -hmm. And so this guy was now playing piano for Vince's wife, Janice, and her mm -hmm. sister, Christine. They had a band called The Sweethearts of the Rodeo, and they were releasing oh, records yeah. that were on the top ten sure. country. And I actually liked their, the two songs that I'd heard. And he said, yeah, I'm playing with these girls, The Sweethearts of the Rodeo. I said, yeah, I've heard, of the, I've heard their stuff. I like their songs. And... Um, he said, well, we just fired a guitar player. We got a three-week tour, and you think you could come down and play it? And I asked him how much it paid, and it was like, wow, yeah, that, <laughs> that sounds great. You know, I'm going nowhere doing what I'm doing, and uh, I've never been to the South, so I'd love to take a trip to Nashville. And he said, well, here's the catch. I said, what's the catch? He said, you got to be here in two days to rehearse because the tour starts like five days from now. And I was like, Okay, I'll do it. So I jumped <laughs> in my car and went to Nashville, you know, with my guitars and a couple amps and some clothes, mm -hmm. uh, not knowing, you know, how, thinking I was going to be there for three weeks. And when I got to Nashville, we rehearsed for a couple of days at SIR, and then we played a couple of shows in Nashville, then went out on the road opening for Alabama. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, it was different, you know. Yeah. Like yeah. I was thrown in, but I met everybody that first week in town. You know, Joe wow. Blazer, yeah, I met him. Like he's been working on my guitars for thirty-five years. Another guy who I'd like you to know. meet. You oh know. yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, I'm playing one of these B benders in my telly right now. Yeah, um, and uh, he was making those then, by the way. <laughs> and uh, you know, I met, of course, Vince. And sure, the first night I played on stage was this giant outdoor thing that they used to have downtown called Summer Lights. I okay. had about eight different stages uh, on uh, down there by the Capitol, uh, okay. the stretch from the Capitol to the courthouse okay. on that yeah. street there. And, mm -hmm. um, it, and we played on the biggest stage, which was in front of the courthouse. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, seeing all these famous people standing on the side of the stage watching me, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, you know, I'm like, I just got this gig. And I'm like, <laughs> the guitar man, you know, right, and I'm right. like, there's all these famous singers, and, you know, standing there looking at me, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, man, you know, I was like, talk about nervous. Yeah. But, you know, that turned out to be a really, really good gig for me. And that was that gig, you know. That was was the, I did that yeah. gig for five years straight, you know, ended up moving here um, and Meet, met everybody doing that and they were really nice people to work for you know they treated me really well and um they they were you know it was a great gig wow it was really easy really good yeah wow. in fact they just called me to uh 
check on my availability to do a live stream. So. Oh, yeah, fantastic. So many years later. Right. Still. How many? You said 35? 35. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, um, that was the gig that kind of got me to where I'm at today. Wow. Really, that wow. was the one. That's you know, and after great. that, I, yeah. I played with Patty Loveless. And, sure. Um, that's where I met my wife, and we we both were on. Uh, first time we played on one of her records, it was a number one record. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> she was singing and I was playing. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And uh, you know, it turned out it was an. That, that worked, huh? Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, and then I played with a bunch of other folks after that. You know, and very cool. And then the Lucinda gig really took me to a whole other world. You know. Yeah. I was yeah. glad to get that gig because I got out of the country thing and totally into another world. And sure. And then when Marty called, uh, I was a big fan of his. And I, I was I had been in town doing sessions, and he called. He said, "You want to start a band?" And <laughs> I said, "Sure." You know, I had yeah. no idea it would. I'd still be doing it twenty years later. Wow. Had zero idea. You know. So talking about Marty uh, Stewart and you know the band that you guys have had. Uh, for 20 years now. Uh-huh. Um, it sounds like that was a very organic, hey, you want to start a band type thing, um, where uh, you guys called up some musicians and got a band together and, and started playing the yeah. songs. I, th- uh, I think I had lunch with him. Okay. And uh, when we, we left it, at, he was going to get a drummer and I was going to find a bass player. Well, little did I know it okay. when... I didn't know that he already had Harry Stinson playing drums okay, and singing. Uh, and Harry, I knew since before I met, moved to Nashville. So oh, wow. when okay. he was playing with Steve Earle and the Dukes, I <laughs> met him when I was opening for him in Denver. Wow. And so I knew all the Dukes and, and Steve and Harry and uh, from prior to moving here. But I, uh, so I looked for a bass player and I found this guy mm-hmm. that, I, <laughs> that I didn't really know him, but uh, I okay. walked. I walked. I was playing with Don one mm-hmm. night, and we took a rare break for like five minutes. And I walked oh, wow. yeah. out, you know, onto the street to yeah. get some air. And I and I walked into the stage, uh-huh. and, and I looked, and there was this guy up on stage singing. Yeah. And I'd seen him around, and I, and he was singing and playing. I was like, that guy's a really good singer, and he's a good bass player. And so I, I got his name and number, and yeah. I said, you might want to try this guy. Yeah. And that's. That was Brian Glenn, and he became oh, our wow. first bass player. He was a Very great cool. singer, you know. The, 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 his blend with Marty and Harry was really good. Very cool. Yeah, he had a great voice and a great. He was a good bass player, and um, wow. so he was there for the first maybe five or six years. I don't. I'm not sure exactly how many years it was. Some somewhere between five and seven years, but okay. And then um, he quit, and we got Paul Martin. Mm-hmm. And um, when um, Paul quit. Um, I was playing with Chris Scruggs, mm-hmm. and um, Chris is, you know, a multi-instrumentalist. So oh, I was yeah. like, man, I said, Chris, uh, Paul Martin's going to quit the Marty Stewart band. And I need you to help us find a, a guy that can play electric and upright and sing, <laughs> you know. And so, can, yeah. you know, you know a lot of people I don't know, so, you know, yeah. if you can rem- recommend, he says, what about me? I said, man, you don't want to do our gig, you know. You're younger than we are, and, you know, we need some, you know. Uh, he said, no, I really want to do it. And I said, well, yeah. you call Marty. Yeah. And, you know, you know, you hash it out with him if you really. So they had a meeting, and he ended up doing it, you know, wow. which was amazing to have Chris in the right. band. I, I still play in his band, too. Yeah. Every instrument. You said he's multi-instrument instrumentalist. I've Every had instrument on, he touches. I've, is I've had just, him on. I've hired him to play yeah. drums on sessions. <laughs> I've hired him to play bass on sessions. I've hired him to play guitar on sessions. Yeah. I've hired him to play steel on sessions. So there you go. And I'm sure every single one of those sessions, he was fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. I love his drumming. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> so cool. Um, so what is the power structure like in that band? Well, that's Marty's band. Yeah. Know? He makes all the, you know, it's his band. We're, we're just, right. uh, uh, you know, we're hired to play per show, you know, basically. Okay. You know? Yeah. But, I mean, we are a band and everything, sure, but it's sure. his, you know, it's, he has his office and his secretary and his agent and his manager and mm-hmm. all this stuff and it's, yeah. all, it's his business. It's his show and yeah, yeah. it's his business. Sure, so he, sure. He pretty much, you know, sometimes he'll, you know, we made a, a twenty-song instrumental record about we started about eight years ago making mm-hmm. it and uh, 
it's been done for a couple of years. Yeah. But it's not out. Uh, hopefully it'll come out sometime. But it's okay. 20 songs that we wrote, uh, in, all instrumentals. And it's sort of like okay. surf music. You know, there's some surf okay. stuff in there. I want to hear that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, and there, it goes, you know, a lot of different areas. But okay. it's But it's really good. And, you know, I got to write, I think I wrote four tunes on that. You know, okay. Of my own that... You know, I brought to the table, and they went for it. That's awesome. And um, I'm really excited about that coming out someday because it's it's really a, a great little thing to listen to. I I, can't I, wait I know to hear one it. of the reasons they <laughs> they haven't released it is because they're trying to shop things in Hollywood to you know film. Oh. Uh, uh, you know, for you know soundtrack okay. work and stuff yeah. like that. They, yeah. You know, they'd like to place one of those in a big film. I'm sure that would That'd be, be good great. Thing. But yeah. you know. They're really, it's really good stuff. Marty wrote yeah. a good deal of it. Chris wrote uh, some of the songs. Harry wrote a couple. Mm -hmm. I wrote some. And we d collaborated on some. And uh, we really had a fun time making it. Some of what we did at um, Studio A in Capitol in Hollywood. Oh, wow. Which was fun. That's um, a fantastic room. Yeah. Well, more than a room. Al but, Schmidt yeah. was hanging out okay. with us. Very cool. And uh, one, uh, uh, one time... We were there. John Mayer was next door, <laughs> and um, but another time we were there, uh, Bob Dylan was next door, and he and oh, Marty wow. go back to the seventies. So we're sitting there in the afternoon. We're done. Yeah, and we're just hanging out, you know, like getting thinking about going to have dinner someplace, you know. Yeah. And Bob walks in, <laughs> and, he, and he comes in. Marty gives him a big hug, and he looks and he says, "I see you have your whole band here with you, you know." <laughs> and was, you know, we he told us stories and hung out for a while. He, you know, it yeah. was kind of cool to. Yeah, to, for Bob I, I Dylan to come so. knocking on yeah. your door right. and come in and tell you stories and hang out and you wow. know he wow. was really affable and friendly and wow clear eyed and it was great <laughs> to you know he's 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 quite a remarkable person you know he's a boxer I, yeah yeah you know, I don't know if you know that he's a, yeah. yeah yeah but you know he's in great shape yeah. for eighty years old you know, yeah. well he wasn't eighty then sure but it was like five sure. years ago but um you know he's seventy five but he was yeah. man he looked great. Yeah. You know, talk, I mean, he, he <laughs> didn't look like a guy that's that old at all. Really? Yeah, not wow. even a little bit. You know, he's like wow. really good shape. And yeah. So uh, kind of coming to the end of the conversation here a little bit. Uh -huh. um, you know, a lot of times I ask uh, the person who I'm interviewing if they have any sort of advice that they would give to a young musician, particularly someone who plays an instrument, not really a singer. Uh, who wants to move to Nashville and, and make it. Now, I'm not going to pose that question to you mm -hmm. because I think that um, it might be better to kind of take this ending in a little bit of a different direction okay. and ask you if you have any advice for someone who wants to try to follow in your footsteps in terms of, um, like you said in the very beginning, kind of walking away from the music establishment as it is now uh -huh. and doing your own thing and kind of getting known for being uh, uh, kind of outside of the, the mold a little bit. Uh -huh. Do you have any advice for someone who, well, who would want to do that? I think right now that's probably the best opportunity is to be different, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably what you need to do. There's, a, there's a, you know, I see so many people coming to town that, you know, Basically, they're just doing something that someone already has done yeah. before, you know, yeah. trying to follow in the footsteps of certain famous guitar players, you know, and sound like them and buy the same gear, and you know, mm -hmm. it, which is fine, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that the people that go the furthest in the music business are the people that have their own brand of music, their own style of music, and it sort of doesn't really have to be in a certain genre it's just their music sure. and and they get known for just doing what they do mm -hmm. and you know i've seen a lot of people you know establish themselves in that way and it seems to be really you know a good way to go you know take neil young for instance you know right. he's a good example of somebody that Never really, he doesn't sound like anybody before him. You know, who sounds like Neil Young? Nobody. Nobody. But he's managed to, you know, you know, you know, influence 
tons of pe- untold people, you know, oh, yeah. untold amounts of people, and always just do what he wants to do. He doesn't even stay within his own mold. Right. You know, he'll he'll do solo acoustic shows, and then he'll have a crazy horse show, <laughs> you know, which is couldn't be any yeah. further polar from, opposites. You know, polar yeah. opposites, but. People don't care because it's Neil Young. They don't care if he's, you know, what what he wants to do. He, they just go to see him because they, they just want to see him, you know. So he's a good example of somebody who didn't play by the rules and s- still stays on top, you know. Sure, sure. I'm sure he can work as much as he wants to or as little as he wants to when yeah. he wants to. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's pretty good. Now, I think that, you know, there's always room for some new forward-thinking kind of stuff, too. You know, there's a lot of great players out there that are doing amazing things on the guitar that maybe most people haven't heard of, but like Julian Lodge. You know, there's a guy who's clearly (laughs) on his own trail. Yeah, yeah. And yet... (laughs) On uh, his own planet right now, I think, yeah. But he's doing things that no one else is doing on the instrument. Yeah. And uh, I don't think anybody's going to come anywhere near him you know, because he's so incredible. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm sure he can work as much as he wants to and do and do quite well, you know. Yeah. Even yeah. in the, you know, within the limited sort of seating kind of venues he plays, um, mm-hmm. you know, he's not going to be selling out, you know, the Ryman. Yeah. Uh, but he's, I'm sure he's working as much as he wants to right now. Yeah. You know, and you know, that's a good example of a, a guy that just went out on his own, did his own thing, and he's getting a lot of notoriety for it. Sure. Well, Kenny, thank you so much for doing this. I Thanks really appreciate me. it. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. And um, we usually do playing at the end, but we're not. We're, we're just going to kind of wrap it up I, you here. Know, I, and I didn't remember that, I guess. It's okay. It's, it's been a long time <laughs> since we had our initial conversation. Yeah, and yeah. This has been scheduled a couple of times, I think. Yeah, it? yeah. COVID yeah. Is, has made it difficult to, yeah. to get this on the books. But um, instead of playing, could we maybe just do an encore and just talk about some gear a little bit sure absolutely okay. i'm a right. gearhead boy <laughs> so you this know. is this is for the guitar nerds out yeah. there who want to stick around and talk for a minute mm-hmm. so what are you taking on the road with you right now um i've been playing my main amp for many many years uh, mm-hmm. i have a 67 deluxe reverb okay that's that uh, todd sharp over at nashville amp service has been keeping running for years and years okay. and years it, right now it has a celestian vintage 30 in mm-hmm. it that he put in there many years ago and he, he todd's great because i'll take in my old vintage amplifiers and generally i'm not a big fan of the speakers that came in those amps okay very seldom do i buy a well start well you know i like the the fender speakers in the 50s, mm-hmm. but whatever they used after like 1963, I'm not a fan of. Oh, oh okay. So they don't, they don't sound good to me for what I want, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, and um, so you know, he's always good about finding the right speaker for whatever amp I bring in, you know. Okay. I'm like, I want it to sound like it's supposed to, you know, but mm-hmm. I don't like this speaker, you know. Give yeah. me something that sounds better, you know. So he's really, you know, he's a great guitar player and a great amp repairman and he he has a couple of cabinets that are loaded with four 12s of okay. all different kinds you know oh. he has like four in this cabinet right. four in this cabinet you so can he just, can he yeah. can like quickly plug into one of those that's cool and check the amp you know yeah. he can go through a bunch of different because all amps are different you know yeah oh yeah and um you know oftentimes i'm surprised at what he puts in you know like the vintage <laughs> 30 i was like wow it does sound good you know i always like those speakers but i didn't yeah. think he would pick that you know yeah and i don't think he did either but um and then uh my main studio amp for a long time has been well the, for the long the longest one that i've used the most it seems uh is a marshall pa20 head oh it's a little okay. 20 watt head mm-hmm probably less than 20 actually 18 probably more like it it's a yeah. two el84s okay. and it has a two channels that are jumped together it's volume and tone volume and tone mm-hmm. i jumped them together so i can get a okay. little bit more juice out of it yeah because it's not a high gain amplifier you kind of have to hit the front end a little bit harder no. with something yeah. like a booster pedal or something and uh, with a uh, a single 12 cabinet that i use with it and that 
I think has a vintage 30 in it as well. And then I have my, my other main studio amp is a 1965 American made Vox Cambridge Reverb. And that's a single 10. Um, right now it has a Celestian Gold 10. Okay. And that's two EL uh, 84s. But it was made in America at the Thomas Organ Factory. Because mm -hmm. in 64, when the Beatles came over, all of a sudden Vox had all these yeah. orders yeah. and they couldn't fill them. There's no way. Right. You know, the whole, they'd never been. No yeah. one ever seen a Vox amp until the Beatles came <laughs> on TV, and then suddenly the whole entire and country invaded, was right. looking for Vox amps. So they made a deal with Thomas Organ. So they they sent them the the Tolex and the and the knobs and the Vox logo <laughs> and the grill cloth and and some hardware and say yeah. just make amps and just make them <laughs> no schematic. make them look like yeah. ours, you know. Yeah. And so they basically. Um, this amp was uh, the the Cambridge Reverb and the Pacemaker, which was the same amp without reverb, were the same amp. It just one had reverb and the other one. Those were sure. only made for a year as a tube amp. Mm -hmm. So I've got one of the year oh, the wow. sixty five Cambridge with yeah. the tube, and the the the, the Pacemaker is another one that's really good too. Uh, that's a great amp. It's same circuit just without the reverb. It's fantastic. Those two amps sound so good. Wow. And uh, I love them. It's like, it's basically a Princeton reverb with two e el eighty okay. fours. Okay. What it is. Okay. And yeah. it's so it has some of that. That box, makes a little bit more sense to me. Yeah. Characteristic, but the yeah. but the preamp, the the um, the reverb and tremolo are totally American. Okay. Yeah, totally Fender all gotcha. the way. You know, it's okay. like they're great. They, and that um, that went on for about four years, and they they're the company that developed the Super Beetle and. Oh, you know, yeah. and the Beatles never saw that stuff till they <laughs> got off the plane and Vox, you know, showed up with right for their American tour. They had these big amps and they were like, and they didn't like it because it said Super Beetle. <laughs> right. They're like, well, we're the Beatles. You, you, now, this is a Super Beetle. They were giving those guys shit about it, you know, probably yeah. in good fun. Right. Uh, yeah. But um, and those were all solid state amps and their early solid state amps sound great. I really mm -hmm. like those, too. I like I. I wouldn't be opposed to getting an early, like a 66 solid state version yeah. of my amp, you know. Those sound really good. Well, if there's anyone out there you that know, has one. Yeah, I have a Standell amp. Um, Do you? Yeah, Which solid one? state, the West Montgomery model. Oh, man. Yeah, single 15. I would die. And it's it's <laughs> so great. Yeah. It's just like, oh, wow. And I, and I have a, a, a really nice brown-faced Princeton that's yeah. in perfect Wow. shape i mean it's wow. like showroom it's brand wow. new basically and that has a alnico eminence in it and then i have a couple of princeton reverbs that have seen a lot of use yeah over the years and those have uh alnico i think those are eminence alnico speakers so since. you kind of prefer the princeton uh, i like princeton's a lot yeah. yeah i have three of them and yeah. i always like those those are really good studio amps they're so versatile mm -hmm. there's nothing you can't do on one of those things man yeah. I yeah. mean, I've I've showed up at sessions with those things. Uh, they're very similar to my Cambridge, really. Yeah. They're very. They're almost the same amp, you know. Very cool. Uh, yeah. But uh, man, those Princetons are great. There's, uh, I, I would say that, I don't like the reissues of the deluxe of the Princeton. I have to okay. say, I'm a I'm a Fender guy. I love Fender stuff. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. actually like their, the one amp they make right now that I like is the Pro Junior Mark IV. I oh. think that's a pretty good amp. The the Oh, the no, the Pro Junior, Pro not junior. the Blues. No, I'm not okay. a Blues Junior guy. Gotcha. Don't like it. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, Pro Junior is pretty good, man. Yeah. You have to keep the the tone way down because it's a bright amp. You gotta. Mm -hmm. But man, that's a that's a good sound. I could do a gig on that amp. Yeah. I could get by. I've taken yeah. that into the studio. I have a couple of those, and I used I used, played through two last night. Oh yeah. At my um, show yeah. with Dave. Yeah. And Pete. Know, the slow beat show, yeah. and, and it, I really liked it. It was like, yeah, <laughs> you know. So that's, that's cool. That's the one amp I really think. It, and I like their um, Chris Stapleton Princeton. Okay, the, it's I a brown had face. A to play that. Oh, yeah, it's killer. He yeah. had like you know, I think he had over ten of those things, and he had oh, one yeah? that he liked. Okay, and that was the one they took and kept trying to chase that kind of, one yeah you reproduce know, it they're yeah. all different you know all yeah. brown face amps are different i've got and, my yeah and he had one that he favored yeah and he was that that's what he plays through on stage just one princeton mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. it's like gets the best sound 
Yeah. And they finally nailed it. And he was um, actually using the new one on stage a couple of years ago. And I played through it at that time. We were opening for him and I played through okay. his and I was like, man, this is a great amp. So man. that's that's the other really good Fender amp that's made right now. It's super wow. good. Man, yeah. I, you can't beat it. Wow. Well, what about uh, guitars and pedals and stuff? Oh, man, pedals. Right. I'm a... I'm a I'm a pedal nut. Are I'm you? A, oh, okay. yeah. I love pedals. I don't use a lot of pedals with Marty. Yeah. You know, it's not really a pedal gig. I use no. a... I've got a picture of your board from a couple of years ago when you guys played that Eddie's Attic gig. Yeah? Do you remember that? Yeah. What's what's on the... Do you know what's on it? I think you've got like three pedals. Uh, three... There, there's only... Oh, there, there, there's only about three or four. You, you've got... Yeah. It's really basic. Now I yeah. use, usually use like an MXR reverb pedal. Uh-huh. There, you know, because a lot of times, you know, the I use the spring reverb on an amp, but mm-hmm. the the on the road, man, those reverb tanks break all the time, you know. Yeah. Because we're you know you're going down the highway. The springs boom, are gonna. Yep. You know? Yeah, I've had and, that um, happen. So that happens a lot. So I always have to have a reverb, and if there's a fly date, you know, you don't know what you're gonna get. Sure. So I always have a reverb pedal and a tremolo pedal on my board, mm-hmm. and um, but you know for. My other life of playing <laughs> other kinds of music, I have a board that has a fuzz face is the first thing I go into. Really? Uh, it's a band of gypsies fuzz. Okay. That's the one that, um, uh, it's the best fuzz, man. I have a fuzz that I bought in si- not 1969. It was used. Yeah. It's a fuzz face. Mm-hmm. And it's the second one I owned. And it was, it's magic. It sounds so good. You but still have it? Yeah, I still wow. have it. But... It's very temperamental. It, it reacts to temperature changes and yeah. humidity. Yeah, and the new yeah. one that uh, Dunlop has, the yeah. the, ba- the Band of Gypsies one is the best because it has germanium and um, what's the other kind of transistor? Germanium oh, and um, silica. S- yeah. Is that it? Yeah, no. Yeah. yeah. Silica. Um, it, it has both, and it's based on the one, the fuzz they used, the mm-hmm. fuzz face that he used with the Band of Gypsies because they kept changing the fuzz face. But anyway... Uh, this thing is super stable and it sounds glorious. It's the wow. best. You roll your volume down to two, yeah, and it just like great sound. It's right, kind of go a clean. Yeah, you're not too terribly dirty, and then you roll it up, and <laughs> you know you get all that wonderful stuff that, that fuzz faces <laughs> can only do. I mean, that's yeah. my favorite fuzz pedal. But I played the new Billy Gibbons fuzz that MXR has. Mm-hmm. Oh man. Yeah. That thing is amazing. I love that. I haven't thing. played it yet. Oh wow. It has a it has a <laughs> EQ uh, band. Man, you're like playing everything six right when or it comes seven out. Band yeah. EQ. Yeah. Oh man, it's the best. That's really cool. It's so cool. And um I really like their Timmy pedal too that they make the yeah. so Timmy yeah. pedal. A lot that's of fans a, of the Timmy that's out a there. Good yeah. pedal. Whoa. Yeah. And I always have a compressor on there. Um I like the exotic and I okay. like and I like the MXR, they, they they call it the bass compressor, but it's really a guitar compressor. It just yeah. says bass compressor on it. But right. the guy, uh, uh, one of the Dunlop guys, says it, it's just the compressor. It's just it just a says compression. bass yeah. on it, but it's a small <laughs> one and yeah. has a. It's kind of mimics the exotic in the way it works. You can it has a blend, uh-huh. so you you can yeah. You, you can blend in your clean signal yeah. and your compressed signal. So I've got a Barber Tone Press. Yeah. That's and uh, and it's got the blend on yeah, it. Yeah, the blend I really is like very... That. You need that, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only have one pedal, one compressor that doesn't have that that I like. It's a barefoot compressor. Okay. And I like yeah. that a lot, too. That's yeah. a good one. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, yeah, the, that MXR bass compressor is cool, a little mini one. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I usually have a volume boost pedal. Uh, okay. I started using the uh, MXR micro amp in about 1976 mm-hmm. or 77 yeah. just to drive the front end of my Fender amp. Mm-hmm. And I found that really helped, you know, yeah. having extra boost, especially if you're playing a Fender guitar, yeah. to hit the front of the amp a little harder. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can control how much. And it's nice. Very cool. And I, I like the new one that they have because it sounds a little different because the one with the bass and the treble control. Mm-hmm. The micro amp with the bass and treble mm-hmm. control. It sounds yeah. a little bit better. You think? So, yeah, I okay. think so. It's something in that circuit that sounds a little bit more friendly. Yeah. I like it. And, kind of uh, meshes with the yeah. defender a yeah, little bit. Yeah, it's really good, man. Yeah. Even when you set the control straight up, and I A-B'd my old one and the new one, it's like, oh, I like this better. Okay. And um, I'm a big delay freak. 
Are you? Current favorite is the Strymon Volante, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah, that well that that thing's a beast. It sounds great, man. Yeah. It's yeah. a party. Yeah. It's really good though. Yeah. It has a reverb on it too. Uh-huh. It sounds good. Yeah. Kind of is supposed to sound like a spring reverb, but it sounds yeah. better than a spring I reverb. I think those things are actually good enough to run as like outboard gear in oh, the studio, absolutely. you know. Oh I mean, yeah. Put it on vocals or something. Oh, it's they're they're very cool. They're magnificent. Yeah. So good. And um and I really like the Keeley um, delay that he has out now. What is that? I think he's got a couple delay. What that? This one he has. It's got a, like a picture of a tape reel on the okay. front of it. Yeah, yeah. That's a, um, that thing is so good. Mm-hmm. I love those things. Yeah. I can't think of what it's called. I have one. I'm drawing a blank right yeah. now. <laughs> um, Keeley delay is. A, yeah. But it's supposed to be, you know, it's it's. Probably his best one. It's so good. Yeah. It's really good. Whoa. That guy makes great stuff. Yeah. And you know, I've I got mean, a few Keeley things. Everything he does is good. Yeah. And I always have a phase shifter and a chorus unit sure. in my bag just yeah. in case. Um, I was talking to a guy yesterday about a session that we have coming up, and he's like, I want Andy Summers. I want you to do Andy <laughs> Summers stuff. I said, okay. Okay. Yeah, man. You know, yeah. I, I, I saw Andy Summers play with the police when they first came out. Yeah, you know, I was knocked out by his voice. You know, his, yeah. The, yeah, all those things he was doing with the chorus and the delay, and it was like yeah. so great. You know, it was like wow. I've got a fun Andy Summers story to tell you when we. When oh, we I'd love to hear it. it. Yeah. yeah, he's he's really good. You know. Yeah. But you know, I well, I've noticed a lot. Of, you know, I try to hang on to pedals that are, go out of favor because everything comes back around. You know. Yes, I, it does. I I I went through twenty years without ever playing a chorus. Yeah. At least. Yeah. You know, it was like, oh, no, I don't ever want to hear a chorus again. And now I'm like, <laughs> wow, that sounds cool, man. Yeah. I like, it. you know, yeah. in the right setting for certain things, you can't beat it. Right. And I have one of those old uh, Roland Dimension 4, the small pedal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah. the purple one with uh-huh. the four buttons. Yeah. You know, man, that thing is amazing. It's How like, old yeah. is that? It's from the 80s. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it's like <laughs> early 80s. Yeah. yeah. It's great. It still works. And I wow. still have one of their old... Uh, the little blue one with the two knobs. Okay. And that's a yeah. great chorus unit too. Wow. And uh and I'm into um what else? What else have I well I always have a wah wah pedal just in case. Sure. I love playing you know, I <laughs> I play a strat a lot. Yeah. You know, people don't know that, but uh, in the studio I always take my strat because yeah. there's certain things that you can't get on any other guitar. Yeah. I usually have a, a jazz master with flat wound strings. Okay. That I take. Uh, I've have one that Jazzmaster Ultra that I really like. Yeah. The latest guitar, man. I, that thing is. I've used that a lot. Really. Yeah. What do you like about it? Everything. It yeah. It just sounds great. It has a hum canceling pickups that sound good. Okay. Um, it's always been a problem, you know, yeah. having single coil pickups. Some studios are really noisy. Yeah. You know, even today, some some of the best studios like. You have to, you know, I, you have, I have to turn couple, and face a certain I way. I have a couple or, of yeah. um, tellies that have hum canceling pickups just because of that. You know, wow. I yeah. use that Billy Gibbons telly bridge pickup that mm-hmm. Seymour Duncan makes in his mm-hmm. custom shop, mm-hmm. and uh, just a regular telly pickup, but it's yeah. uh, it's hum canceling. I don't know, but it sounds great. Yeah. And then one of those uh, hum canceling bridge pickups that Seymour okay. makes. Those are yeah. good. Sound good, man. Hey, man. And what um, I like Lindy Fraylin's hum canceling pickups too. He's got, mm-hmm. I got a lot of his pickups. Yeah, yeah. I've only got one guitar with Fraylin's, but I, I, I'm a big fan of the Seymour Duncan stuff. Like yeah, we, me too. I think we talked about this off camera, but the, the guitar sitting over here to my yeah. right has uh, the the new Seymour Duncan Brad Paisley. Yeah, the secret oh. agent. Man, I'll tell you what. Yeah, that uh, Brad Paisley Fender I have that pickup that Tim Schaub developed for mm-hmm. the bridge. Yeah, he copied it from a '63 telly pickup. Mm-hmm. It it's sounds so good. What is that called? They've got a name for it. I'm sure they do. Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds so good. Yeah. But you know, another guy is Don Mayer, M A R E. Okay. He's nuts. He's out in LA. Okay. He's been in the pickup business for a long time. He, yeah. he I have a lot of his pickups. His stuff sounds good. And Curtis Novak. Oh. Great, great pickups. I know that name. Oh. What about uh, Baritone? Do you do much on with uh, with baritone I've never guitar? I've tried their stuff. No. no, no, no. The the guitar style, the like a baritone guitar. Oh, baritone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I always have a, a Dan Electro baritone six string okay. bass that I use. Yeah. Um, I always take that. Yeah. And 
The thing about baritone is I hardly ever use the lower octave. Really? I usually play them in the same range that I could get with a normal guitar. It's just those heavy strings. It's, it's the longer the, string length, yeah. the heavier strings. Mm -hmm. there, it's a different tension. It just has a different sound. And yeah. people think that they want you to use that low octave. Right. Right. And I just nod my head and, and then when the <laughs> red anyway. light goes on, I play the notes I think that it needs. And yeah. oftentimes, more often than not, I'm not using the low octave. Yeah. yeah. Because just because it's there yeah. doesn't mean you have to use it. Yeah. A lot of times I've heard baritone players use that and it's like, you're playing in the wrong octave, but you know, that doesn't sound <laughs> right. That sounds like shit. Why don't you, you know, if you moved it up, it would sound three times as cool. Yeah. You know, and yeah. people, you know, it's kind of like uh, five string bass players, you know. Um, yeah, I got to the point where I hated five string bass. Yeah. But then I went and saw this guy and he was playing a five string bass and it was the greatest bass player I've ever seen in my life. And it sounded so good. I was like, well, see, he knows what to do with it. It's all on how you do it's it. It's all, yeah. you know, it's not it's not the equipment. It's the player. Yeah. And now I, you know, he 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 cured me of my five string problem <laughs> i no longer look well, down on, on that instrument you know it took well, that one to guy yeah. you know <laughs> and it was like oh man he yeah. would hit the a low note and i was like yes <laughs> you know that sounds good and you know meanwhile you played five sessions last week with five string players that were like you know like oh you're right know, no back don't, to it don't, right? you're playing, don't play don't play that low you know not in this well, song maybe next song <laughs> just because it's there doesn't mean you have to use it you know i like that you know well kenny um i think it was a, uh, this was fun this All was right. so fun man oh, i really I enjoyed this and i hope you got something that yeah you can yeah well this was the encore and if if you made it to the end to the end thank you guys so much uh for watching and kenny again thank you man thank this you was for a having lot of fun. me i really yeah. appreciate it yeah all right that's